What is up everybody? Hello and welcome back to Cash the Line. Now I know I had just done a live stream uh, talking about the Get to Know Me Challenge and answering a whole bunch of questions, but there were a few things about that stream that didn't quite work out so well, so I decided I'm gonna do a much, much more condensed version of that just to answer these questions and because that really is the whole point of this challenge. And if you want to, you can watch those uh, two live streams where I chat with people live in the chat room and discuss a whole bunch of stuff that's all surrounding these questions coming up. But for this one, let's just get into the questions because that's really what the challenge is about. And then I'm going to challenge three more people and uh, also got a little bit of a giveaway uh, related to some of the stuff in these questions. So let's get started. I was challenged by uh, Geo Dudes and the Geocaching Vlogger who have both answered these questions in videos of their own. Uh, you can check that out. I'll put links to their videos in the description below. So check them out. But let's get right to the questions. <laughs> so first of all, personal questions. There are seven personal questions and seven geocaching questions. So number one, personal question. Where did you grow up and where, did you where do you live now? So I was actually born in England. Uh, it was in Chichester when I was born in 1978 and we moved to, my family moved to Canada when I was less than a year old and I've lived in Ontario ever since. So uh, you can probably tell from some of my videos, but I live in southern Ontario in kind of the uh, Tri-City, uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, Guelph kind of center point of that arrowhead of southern Ontario. It's about an hour west of Toronto. And um, uh, there's a whole lot of stuff happening here and it's great and I've lived here since as long as I can remember, maybe eight years old, well, not eight years old, maybe uh, five or six years old or something. <laughs> there's a lot of history in just these Tri-Cities area. <clears throat> so, question number two, do you have any pets? I, uh, I, I did, I have, I did, I didn't grow up with any pets, but uh, when I moved into this house, um, a few years, a couple years later, I adopted two pets who I named after two characters in a story that I absolutely loved as a huge fan of the Halo franchise. Uh, for Halo 2, they did a, um, uh, a promotional campaign before the game was launched called I Love Bees, which happened online. There were lots of puzzles, a huge story unraveled over the course of a few months, and it was, it was, just, it was awesome. It was totally awesome. And two of these characters were called Jersey and Durga. Jersey was like uh, this this teenage uh, guy who was like a, a nerd, kind of tech, techie related. He knew all this stuff. And Durga was an artificial intelligence from the future, from 2552, that uh, that crash landed, as it were, back in 2004. 2004? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so these two characters, Jersey and Durga, uh, had this really cool dynamic, this interesting dynamic. And I just loved it so much that I named these two cats Jersey and Durga. Now, as time went on, um, I gave them up. I gave them both of them up for uh, for adoption to other people because geocaching started taking over everything, and so I'm, I was barely at home, and so I didn't feel like my cat Durga at the time because I had uh, let Jersey go earlier. Um, I didn't feel that Durga was getting all the love and care that she deserved, and so I, I, I adopted her out and. Uh, which fit a lot more with lifestyles. Um, so I don't have any cats now, it's just me and my house and my Deja, my Geomobile that is sitting in the car. It's not sitting in the car, it's sitting in the drive. <laughs> um, favorite activity as a kid, question number three. So there's a number of things that happened as a kid. and I, I, I love to collect things, so I, I used to do a lot of card collecting. Uh, you know, for whether it was sports, like baseball cards or basketball or whatever, um, or video games or, you know, however many different um, topics and brands there were out there. You know, go to the store and you buy these little packs of five to ten cards and then hope you get all the rare cards and trade and check the values and buy and sell all that stuff. And so collecting was huge. But even bigger than that, and in around the early, early not late late 80s, early 90s, somewhere around there, marbles were a huge, a, a very popular uh, thing that kids would play with. When I was in grade school, uh, before grade six, I remember we would, uh, there would during recesses, people would be sitting with their backs to the wall outside, and it sounds kind of funny, but um, with your legs uh, separated, you'd put a marble 
in in the middle there <clears throat> and the whole idea was all these people lined up against the wall and if you you could either do that or you could walk from person to person with your own marbles your bag of marbles and if you saw one that you really wanted then this whole competition was to uh to try to take your mar one of your marbles and hit that other marble and so you'd walk up to somebody and say uh well you you, you want that marble and so you've got these can i can i try with this marble because they might want certain marbles as well and if you agreed then you'd try throwing your marble to hit theirs from a certain distance like maybe uh five six feet or something like that and if you hit it you get to keep it but if you miss it they get to keep your marble so there's there's a bit of a, a trading kind of game going on here <laughs> and so some of these kids got really super skilled at hitting marbles and they would just win everything and you know some people weren't happy about that <laughs> but um Marbles were really popular, and one my friend and I we used to uh, to play. And when if we were at somebody's house, we would take our marbles and we would just do like this indoor scavenger hunt, where one person would hide them around the basement or hide them in little nooks and crannies or upstairs, downstairs, wherever, and then the other person would try to go find them. That was the game, and it was fun. It wasn't it wasn't a trade or, or keep marbles. It was just to have fun uh, going out and. Um, finding marbles scavenger hunt and ironically that is exactly what we're doing as adults now with geocaching Woohoo! <laughs> question number four what was the first car you owned my first car is my current car and that is deja in the driveway and deja is also a name from halo it is the name of an ai that worked with katherine halsey in the development of cortana and so i thought it was kind of neat to have uh, another halo themed name in the fam <laughs> um, If you no question number five if you could watch only one movie for the rest of your life What movie would that be that is a an interesting question because it's not favorite movie It's what movie would you watch for the rest of your life? And it's a little different so I had to think about that one for a while What movie could I watch over and over and over again and not get bored so or annoyed. <laughs> it wasn't so much about a specific movie, it was more about a, a class, a style of movie, a genre. And so I was thinking about music, about how, you know, it, it's really easy to passively listen to music and it just engages other parts of your brain, whereas with the movie you kind of have to pay attention to dialogue and all that stuff. So merging those two, I kind of feel like it would have to be a musical. Um, and there are quite a number of musicals because you know if you listen to a musical uh, soundtrack you could I, There's some soundtracks you can listen to over and over and over again and never get bored So I kind of narrowed it down to a couple of my favorite musical movies one would be Moulin Rouge I really liked the soundtrack and there are some great songs on there and this story is is really interesting as well but on top of that I would have to say the movie that I could watch for the rest of my life <laughs> Which doesn't necessarily mean back to back. There could be any number of gaps between, but the only movie with the rest of my life probably have to go with The Greatest Showman. I love, absolutely love that soundtrack. There are some amazing uh, musical numbers. The story is inspiring and heartfelt, and, and it's just a, a, a happy movie with great choreography and amazing music. And I think I would, I would, it would at least take me the longest time to get bored of watching that movie over and over and over again. <laughs> I already listened to the soundtrack so many times already over and over again. <clears throat> Number six, if you could meet any historical figure or famous person in history, who would that be? I think there's only one real good answer to that. Because <laughs> there's so many people throughout history that have so much input on various things, right? And it's like, who do you ask? It's, it's a tough question to answer. So I think the only one that really fits all of that would be Jesus! Meet him. There are so many questions he could answer. <laughs> um, that's what I have to go for. Number seven, during these times, <clears throat> what is the one skill or hobby you would like to pick up? Um, there's a lot of stuff I'd love to be able to do, but during these times is the little caveat. And so considering something to be able to do at home, alone, um, I'm not very much of a handy person, but there's so many people right now that seem to be building things and I don't have the tools or the space or the, the, the skills to really 
construct these things. I would love to have that skill because even with geocaching, there's there's gadget caches being built out the wazoo. You know, behind the cache is, is now moved into uh, documenting how he's creating these various gadgety puzzle cache boxes and stuff. And he's got tons of tools. I'm like, I have nothing. If I had the tools and the, uh, the, the, the skills, the knowledge, a little bit of experience, then it would be really cool to be able to be more of a handy guy to be able to, to create that kind of thing. So that was something I would love. And it's perfect for these times because you can do it just outside and, and if you've got a little bit of room, you can construct things and, and be creative and be inspired. So onto the geocaching questions. Number one, how did you get into geocaching and when did you first start? Um, I have a video specifically about that. It's the ghost ship geocaching on my 10 year cache anniversary. Uh, so to celebrate my 10th year of geocaching, I revisited the first geocache that I ever found and um, explored a whole lot more about its history. And you can see that in the video, which I'll link up in that corner up there. Yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And so that was back in 2009, and I had just bought an iPhone 3GS and asked, asked people just in general on the internet, uh, what, what, what games should I get? What app should I get? I don't know what to do with this. Like, you know, give me a recommendation. And somebody said, hey, you get the geocaching app and check that out. So I was like, okay. And then days later, that's when I actually found the first cache over 200 kilometers from home when I was out for a weekend up in uh, the Bruce Peninsula, the tip of the Bruce Peninsula at Tobermory. And that was my first cache, the first find, and haven't looked back since. Same, I've been using iPhone ever since. No, no dedicated handheld GPS, it's been smartphone and iPhone all the way. <laughs> um, <clears throat> question number two, what do you enjoy most about geocaching in your area? Uh, my area is, is, is rife with variety. There's just so much geocaching going on here. Southern Ontario, Ontario as a region itself has been a hotbed for geocaching. Uh, Groundspeak HQ has run a couple of experiments and tests in our area to try some things. Um, so it's really hard to narrow down the most enjoyable thing. But I would have to say that despite all of the challenges, all of the techie kind of puzzles um, and, and uh, all, all the rural areas around like farmlands that the roadsides uh, provide so much f option for um, uh, park and grab power trails things like that there's so many caches everywhere um, I think the, the the thing that takes the cake would have to be uh, river trails so, um, southern Ontario has rivers everywhere I mean if you look at the map you can see lines and, and waves and, and, and all this stuff all over the place. The Grand River especially cuts right through the center and then it's got some offshoots and these rivers are maybe a couple of feet deep so they're perfect for like day-long tubing adventures and so people have placed caches along the shorelines of these rivers and if you just scroll around in southern Ontario you can see these lines of green of traditional caches and geo arts all over the place and these are all high terrains these are like four four and a half five terrains and uh, you can either you could some of them you could walk if you wanted to but most of them you would use a tube or a canoe or a kayak and go for a day from one end to the other and just pick up loads and loads of geocaches like 50 100 plus in a day and uh, a long day <laughs> but it's just so much fun, especially when you've got a group of people, a group of friends, or ha hold an event and then go off and uh, and do these river trails. So river trails, I think, would probably be my favorite thing about my region, about this region in geocaching. Uh, would you rather find an amazing geocache in an average location or an average geocache in an amazing location? I am more, I, I am kind of more all more come more I don't know how to say that <laughs> I am more about I think the adventure and the journey than the specific geocache and that's not to say that geocaches cannot aren't amazing and uh and so creative and well created but I personally I think I find more um more memorable experiences through the hunt from beginning to end getting from a to b the experience the sights the, um, the accomplishments, that sort of thing. So I would have to say I would prefer an average geocache in an amazing location because there's just so much more you can get out of that. Um, again, not to downplay amazing geocaches at all. They're fun to get, but the experience, it's all about the experience. Um, <clears throat> number four, what is one geocaching milestone you are most proud of? 
it's hard to narrow down milestones because challenge caching is, is like a huge part of what I love about geocaching right now. But um, I think over the last number of years, uh, there's been kind of an increase in, I don't know if we call it a milestone, but an accomplishment, which is altitude. Uh, a number of years ago when I first started, near when I first started, uh, I was in Alberta and visited Banff, and one of the caches that uh, I thought was stunning to find there was the virtual at the top of Sulphur Mountain. And it's at about 2,200 meters, but there's a gondola that goes up there from the parking, so it's a very touristy kind of area, but you get the view over the mountain range, and it's just unbelievable. Um, but that ascent is about 500 meters from parking, and it's not a hike. But that was at 2,200 meters. Later on, uh, I managed to get to Seattle, and uh, when we were there, we wanted to get old caches, so we targeted GCD, which is one of the oldest active caches, and it's on Mount Margaret. That is an altitude of 1,500-ish uh, meters, um, but that one is a hike, and that one is very compressed. So it's, it's only about a 400-meter altitude, so a 400-meter ascent from the trailhead where you start but it's like compressed, so it's really steep. But the views are just amazing because you're going up Mount Margaret and you're looking out. It's like zigzagging all the way up. You look out and you can see Mount Hood off in the distance. So you've got the White Cap Mountain and it's just, it's just an amazing experience. But it's a little more strenuous of a hike. Um, and then a few years later after that, so that was the first 400 meter ascent hike. A couple years later, I went to Iceland and one of the targets there was this uh, mountain in one of their national parks called Krista Tinder. And that one is about 1,100 meters uh, altitude, so not the highest, but you start out pretty much at sea level at about 80 meters. So that one's almost, a, that's about a kilometer ascent to get to that one. It's a long hike. Think about the shape of a boot. You start out at the bottom, there's a bit of a hill, and then it's kind of long, slow incline, and then you get to the mountain, and you get right up to the top. And that one was just spectacular. I, I, I don't know what other words to use. Phenomenal, spectacular, amazing, awesome. Um, <clears throat> Chris and her Tinder, that was like the first uh, uh, wintry mountaintop kind of experience that I had when you get there, because you look around, there's glacier on one side and white mountains. It's just, it was unbelievable. Uh, so that, so pushing it just a little further, that was a kilometer ascent. <clears throat> But then last year, as, uh, as uh, documented in one of the Scotland videos, I think it was day three or day four, I still can't remember, um, I went and targeted Ben Nevis, <clears throat> which is the tallest mountain in Great Britain, uh, basically that, the main island there. And it's an altitude of 1,300 meters, just over 1,300 meters. And uh, when I first targeted that, I wanted to publish an event to gather some locals and meet and greet and all that stuff. And before I could get that published, I was communicating with some of the locals. Um, that's when Hill Gorilla, AKA Nick Parker, he published a breakfast event at the top of the mountain at, at I think the time was 9 a.m. And uh, so I was like, okay, this is, this is just crazy. I, that's the day I'm going to be doing the mountain climb that day. I got to get to the breakfast event for that. So that was why in that video, you'll see what I, I, I left the uh, trailhead, the inn uh, at about four o'clock in the morning and we were supposed to meet there, but everybody else or some of the people had already left. So uh, I was kind of in between a wide spread of people <clears throat> and it was dark, headed off up the trail and then eventually made it up and had a little bit of a late breakfast, but it was a super fun, absolutely amazing experience. And that is also in the video in the Scotland playlist, day three or four. Um, yeah, so that currently is my <clears throat> milestone, I guess. That was a 1,300 meter ascent. That was from about 20 meters at sea level at the trailhead up to just over 1,300. That's nuts. <clears throat> but um, I, yeah, it's, it's all about, it's, for me, for those, it was all about pushing the limit just a little bit further. And uh, so I'm, I'm sure I'm not ever going to get to the point of like climbing Mount Everest. <laughs> That's like super, a, a totally different skill set and, and equipment and training and all that stuff. But uh, to be able to do a climb like that, and there's still a whole bunch more in North America. And then there's some in like in the UK and Europe and Australia. I'm, are there any mountains in Australia? I'm not sure. New Zealand. So I mean, there's lots of options. Um, <clears throat> just for great, amazing experiences like that. Uh, anyway, next question number five, geocaching. What is your next geocaching goal? So 
goal isn't so much an altitude, <laughs> but I think for this year, for the next goal, um, based on somebody else, I can't remember, but they said uh, they were going to try to find, I think a few people are actually going to try to find 2020 caches in 2020. So this year I am aiming to get at least 2020 caches, which is about 170 finds per month average. Uh, so it's not, it's not a small feat, but there are some people that have no problems with that. And in Southern Ontario, we've got caches everywhere. There's still thousands to find just within a few hundred kilometers of here. So no shortage of caches to find. It's just getting out and finding them. And now with this whole isolation thing, we'll see how it goes. But so far I'm on track and I'm actually a month ahead. <laughs> so yay. The other goal that I'm also working on, <clears throat> hopefully for this year, uh, is Triple Jasmer, which if you don't know what a Jasmer is, it is finding a geocache that was placed in every month since geocaching began. So that was May 2000 until their current month. And uh, I've already completed two loops of those, so that's I've got two caches that were placed in every month since geocaching began. Triple Jasmer is getting a little hard because there are some months where there are very few worldwide that qualify. And so I'm just a couple of months away from getting a triple. Quadruple is as high as you can get currently because there's one month, August 2000, where there are only four active geocaches in the world that were placed that month. And one of them is in Sweden. <laughs> so I can get to triple in North from uh, the, the last one that I need is in North America. But to be able to get to a quadruple Jasmine, number four, I have to get to Sweden. So that's not going to be a goal for this year, but it's kind of a more of a long-term goal. Triple Jasmine, doable. Quadruple, that's a big one. Um, where is one place you have not gone geocaching and would like to someday? Sweden! <laughs> for that fourth Jasmine qualification cache. Um, just the one. But, I mean, there's going to be tons of other great caches in Sweden, I'm sure. Uh, same with Brazil. There's one cache in there that I want to get. Um... And that is an ape cache. It was the last last surviving original ape cache before there's one in Seattle that had been archived and is now re-archived. So there are two ape caches active in the world, and one of them is in Brazil. The Seattle one isn't going to be too hard to get. That one will have to wait until next year, going to HQ for the 20th year celebrations in 2021 because of the one-year uh, uh, postponement due to COVID-19. Um, so that is the other one, Brazil. And then there's Greenland and Iceland. Both of those have amazing landscapes and uh, natural sites, and I really want to see both of those. Ireland especially, because, wow, they've got the cliffs of despair. It would be, love, it would be awesome to be able to see that in person, <laughs> if you know Princess Bride. Um, last question. Favorite geocaching memory? This one was a hard one to whittle down to one. Um, one of them I mentioned already was the hunt for the griffin. That, uh, I, yeah, so I, I've, I've chosen five. One of them is the hunt for the griffin, which was, again, the experience of going back to the first cache that I found and learning more about the about its namesake, the plaque that was dedicated to the USS Griffin, which went missing in the Great Lakes. Did a whole bunch of research about that and then traveled up to the Manitoulin Island and far out to the end to the lighthouse, which boasts the, only, the, the most likely place of where that ship has crashed. And while you can't get to the shipwreck location because it's on private property, they have tons, tons of information and all of this stuff anyway has already been long cleared out. Um, so that was a huge adventure to go uh, and find that. That's an awesome memory. Um, and these are in no particular order. <clears throat> Second of five was my first 5-5 five, five find. Five difficulty and five terrain, so the hardest rated possible cache uh, is called Tomb Raider, and it's posted in San, San Diego. Um, it's a mystery cache, so you have to solve the puzzle in order to figure out where to go to find the container. The puzzle wasn't too hard, relatively speaking. The cache, the geocache, was, is about, it still is, it's active, is about 80 miles east of San Diego in the desert, in a mudflat desert. And I was there that year for, in 2009, <clears throat> this is on my first year of geocaching too. 
Uh, so I was out there for uh, the Comic Con that year with some other friends who were non-geocachers, and I convinced them, hey, we, we should go out and find this geocache. This is going to be an awesome experience. And uh, so five of us went out in one person's Prius, <laughs> a hybrid, driving through the desert, through the sand, blowing out the back, all that stuff. <clears throat> we had a couple of cases of water, and it was hot. We, it, it, we had five people in the car, and we were uh, hot. We decided to open the window, and you open the window, and you got wind, but the wind is hot. It was ridiculous. We closed the window and just pumped the air conditioning, and we're like, is, is this car going to survive this trip? Um, and, yeah, it was. she was absolutely sure it would be fine uh, for gas, for all that stuff. And uh, so we got to the trailhead, and with this particular cache, you come to the trailhead, which is the entrance to a cave, so it's mud flats and there's, so there's like, it's flat on top, but it's a whole lot of crevices and, and whatnot. Uh, I think probably 20, 20 to 30 meters higher. So <clears throat> you come to this uh, cave entrance and you've got about a 20 minute hike through this underground cave and it's, it's like hard mud, but there's earthquakes and things do shift rarely, but they do. Um, and you eventually get to a point where you can see the light at the end of the tunnel and you find out that it's like, you're, you're at the bottom hole of a funnel and you've got to climb out this incline which is all the way 360 around climb out this incline um there's kind of a little trail a little gully where people have climbed up before it's only ever found maybe three two three times a year um but you follow this incline up to the top and then you emerge on the top of the desert and it's just flat and crevices and holes all over the place it all looks the same you do not want to lose where you came out because that is your only way back to the trailhead um so I was the only one with a GPS, and it was the iPhone 3GS. <clears throat> and um, you can, there's more in the video as well. I made I, this was before I was vlogging, and uh, but I had taken some video to to record the fun. But when you get onto the top of the desert, you've got another hundred meters uh, up down a couple of hills to get to the container, which was just a metal tub with no lid, and there was like dust and sand inside. Clean it off a bit, and then you pick up the log and it was like a petrified stone of paper and I, it's like knock, 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 it's that hard, it was like a stone. Um, but we managed to take photos and video and sign it and so uh, log that is found. <clears throat> but uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll link to the video as well because that was a huge fun experience. That's GCWD13, the geocache. And uh, you can still find it, it's still active. It was placed by a scout group and uh, people still visit it, and there's there's trails. You can see the pathway a little bit to get to the container from there, uh, so it's it's doable, but it, it's a 5.5, five, and it's pretty extreme, but it's awesome. That was a great experience. Um, <clears throat> thirdly, my area, we have a lot of people who love caching at night, so we've got this group called the BFL group. Um, it's the like big flashlight, and... Uh, so they, they love going out caching at night. <clears throat> and typically, they go out every Friday night to go find caches as a group of friends together to target a new area and find a bunch of caches. And um, it was it, it's such a popular concept that they, uh, up to a few years ago, they held an annual event called the BFL Boot Camp. And <clears throat> that annual event was one where people would set up uh, a number of geocaches um, that were intended to be found at night. So like flashlights required, um, and it's kind of winter, it was kind of October, so you'll want winter warm clothing, uh, food and drink because it's at night and you don't know how long you're gonna be out there. These caches were designed to take anywhere from like a half hour, an hour, a few hours to finish one of them. Um, there were experiences. And uh, every year it would be a new theme and a new set of geocaches. And until a few, re a few years ago, um, that event was really popular and I have some awesome memories of those events um, because there's because of the uh, the way that the caches are set up being so long um, it's very rare that you'd be able to find all of the caches in that series in one day in one night so some of us would attempt to take to make it an all-nighter and find everything <laughs> and I still remember there was one great experience where <clears throat> the group of us were walking along the top of a hill and it was like the sun was rising, it was 6 a.m., and we were on that last stretch of a hike to get to the final cache, the meta cache, the one, the bonus cache where you've gathered information from everything in the series in order to find this one to complete the whole series. And we were like, it's, it's like, it's a win right there. <laughs> Success, the sun is rising, it's just celebrating the fact that you are the FTF on the whole series. 
Um, that was an awesome experience. Memories, so many memories. But the best news is the BFL boot camp is coming back again this year, so there will be news to come about that. Um, uh, we're, we're getting new caches placed and a new theme, and it's going to be awesome. And so I've already got a few videos uh, which are throughout uh, the Cache the Line published videos about the BFL, so you should just be able to search BFL and find out more about that. Um, night caching is a very... It's a different kind of caching, <laughs> a different kind of geocaching experience. But especially if you're with a group of friends, it can be so much fun, whether you're just finding regular caches at night or finding night-specific geocaches. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, number four, almost done. Number four, when I went to Iceland a couple years ago, it was over my birthday. So it was the end of November, beginning of November, November 30th is my birthday, and uh, I had that trip planned. It had to be for that period of time. So I was in Iceland for my birthday, and that on, for that day, I had planned to, to get to uh, a geocache that hadn't been found for a long time. So it was an FTF opportunity. But uh, in this particular one, it was found just a couple of weeks before I went, and I was like, no, I can't get the FTF on that. There was another one I got the FTF. But for this particular cache... Um, I, I managed to get there on December 1st at about, it was 6, six or 7 a.m. And so it was hovering around zero, around freezing. There was some light snow coming down, pitch black. It, it was, there was nothing out in the horizon. Not, it was like, it was all empty, nobody around. And it was just this hot pot. And there was, it's just this uh, kind of a, a bowl, like a kettle-shaped bowl in the ground with a light trickle of hot water and uh, in and out. And... There was room for maybe six people. That's about the size that they recommend. And it was just me alone, pulled up. And I just, I sat in there and leaned back. It wasn't bubbling, but I had a thermometer and it registered about 42 or 44 Celsius. And just sit back and be like, ah, oh, this is awesome. That was an amazing experience. That was like a treat yourself to a birthday sort of thing. <laughs> but if you get to Iceland, there are so many hot springs that are uh, accessible. Some of them are tourist hotspots and they might be closed or they might cost to get in, but there are a number of spots all around the country that they're just, they're just out there and there's roads, there's ways to get there and enjoy them that don't cost anything and they're not busy because they're not known very well. And that's because geocaching gets you there. If it's, a, it's an amazing place, an amazing location, then there's probably a geocache there. And that's how I discovered that one. <laughs> so that is another big plus for geocaching as a tour guide. <laughs> um, fifth, I mean, the, uh, memories build up, especially in geocaching over time, but I think so many good memories come from uh, road trips. And, uh, and so I, I've done videos doing road trips before, but I mean, especially if you're going on road trips with friends, those memories just rack up. They just pile up, they stack because you're you're exploring, you're discovering, and um, and so I'm always looking forward to the next road trip and planning for it, finding uh, geocaches that you need for challenges or for just because they're highly rated favorites and stuff. I just wish that fuel was free. If fuel was free, that's almost a tongue twister. <laughs> road tripping would be so much more so much more fun, so much more uh, accessible to do. Um, even the, the fuel right now is so cheap, but traveling is restricted. Uh, uh, why can't you just let us travel for cheap gas? As soon as we can travel again, the gas is going to go up. Ugh, why? Um, so looking forward to more road trips, and there are more to come. The uh, on that note, the Scotland mini series, the Scotland cash tour that I'm that I'm publishing. There's three more videos left. And uh, there's a tease for what the next one is coming up shortly. And I'll link to that probably in one of the side videos once it's up. And uh, then uh, there's two more videos after that. One, uh, there's a whole bunch of cameos from some UK geovloggers who I managed to meet up with. And we had some fun finding caches and chatting and, and getting to know each other that way. Uh, and then the last one, uh, I went down to the south end of England for some family stuff. And then drove, worked my way back up to Edinburgh to fly out that day, but I had to pass through Stonehenge. So the last video of the Scotland series is Stonehenge. Love it. And 
finally, after that series is done, I'll be getting back into the Geo Woodstock road trip um, for a whole bunch of oldies, visiting a bunch of states. The the main event of Geo Woodstock 20, uh, 2019. I'm <laughs> getting my ears mixed. No, 2018. Yeah, last. Wait, this is 2020. 2019, last year. Years are getting totally messed up. Um, uh, down in Texas. And uh, there's a whole bunch of really cool adventures going down there. Especially... What I'm hoping to get for next Sunday, or May 3rd, uh, my video from Mingo to celebrate its birthday, which I'm really excited about. I'm going to have so much fun putting it together. <laughs> Can't wait for that. So stay tuned. Um, uh, make sure that you tune in on Friday, May 1st with two adventures with Dan. I'll be on his uh, Friday night live cash chat show. That'll be 9 o'clock Eastern on Adventures with Dan. And then Saturday... Cash Canada. I'll be on uh, with Land Monkey and a, I can't remember which state, a reviewer from the US. And we'll be doing a whole bunch of chatting there as well. So tune in Cash Canada at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, and subscribe to those channels if you haven't already. Uh, and I now have to tag three other geo vloggers to do this get to know me challenge. And so, first of all, I am going to tag Koma Kino and the kid, Rich Sleefer. These questions are coming to you next, <clears throat> as well as the Aussie geocacher, C. My Shell, Craig My Shell, you're up. Uh, we'll make sure that you get those questions. And thirdly, the curious Kiwis, you guys are up next as well. So you, I'm going to tag you three and uh, make sure you get the questions. Uh, look forward to hearing your answers and <laughs> whatever kind of fun stuff you may have. Um, you know, before I, I, I forget, little, uh, little, little... Bricky, Bricky guy here, Bricky Bruce. He's like me. This is this is the foon. This is uh, the way that I believe the foon should properly be done. It's like a running man pose, right? So if you're walking and uh, you're going and you just stop, that's that's the, the form of the foon, right? And so little Bricky Bruce here is uh, is fooning for me, for you guys, and. He is feeling kind of lonely, just kind of stuck out here all day. He does travel cash to cash sometimes, but uh, he kind of wants to be discovered too. So there you go, L-E-F-R-V-Y. Do a discover, Bricky Bruce, say hi. <laughs> he's, uh, he's looking forward to meet, meeting you. Um, so that, that's the food. This is the shape that is in the logo, in the Cash the Line logo. This is the pose. And you'll see me do this sometimes in photos or videos. Uh, that is the foon. In my opinion, this is the proper foon. There are some ways that people do the foon, like uh, a Superman pose, arm outstretched and back, and or uh, two arm and leg in the same direction. <clears throat> and it just, it doesn't look right. It just seems really odd. And it's not like, you don't walk like that. You don't run like that. That's not a foon. It's a running man pose. I'm OCD about this. I know the, the creator of the Foon, the person who uh, first struck it, um, he has explained it, just putting one arm and one leg back and either way works and all. I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, how do you say GIF or GIF? <laughs> it's that same argument with the Foon. And I say, there's one way to do a Foon right, and that's it. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> the, so you can discover him. Uh, I got a whole bunch of other stuff. But if you want more to discover, watch the live streams, which, again, are linked in the description below. There's a part one and part two because for some reason, my browser decided to crap out on me and I couldn't get back to the feed, so I had to start a new one. So there's a, a second part. And there's a whole lot more detail about a lot of the stuff that I talked about in this 40, 45-minute video. <laughs> um, and so check that out if you want stuff to discover. And... Because of this, I do have a little contest that I'm going to run, a giveaway, inspired by Bricky Bruce here, for one of these awesome new foil stickers that I've also given away recently. So I'm going to give away another one of these, plus one of the Cash the Line Path tags. If you haven't already seen or got one, here is your chance. Here is the Cash the Line path tag and the right way up foil sticker for 2020 the terrain trifecta uh, i'm going to give away these two things to the 20th 20th person i want you guys to get this right <laughs> 
um, 20 person to email me a photo of themselves doing a foon in the proper form. In the proper form. Please do it the proper form. <laughs> um, so just walk along, get somebody with a camera, say stop, take a picture. There you go. There's your food. <laughs> um, so looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with for that. And the 20th person to email me that will be the winner. I will announce that on social media, on all of the channels, on the Facebook, on the tweet face, tweet blot, tweet blot all the stuff. I don't know what I was just pointing to. <laughs> um, but uh, so giveaway time. And I think that's about it for all those other details. Check the other live stream videos. And uh, if there's nothing else, I will then say stay tuned for more from Scotland and from the road trip to Texas. And I will see you in the next video. And on that note, as always, thank you for watching and happy caching and excellent adventuring. See ya.